love that opportunity. I've been a part of CCC now for since 2020, uh, the year that most people want to, most pastors want to forget ever existed <laughs> on the face of the earth. But praise the Lord, we've made it through the rain. Hallelujah, made it through everything. And God, we, we came out on the other side with a testimony of God's grace and God's victory. But anyway, we came apart, and, and we talked regularly on the telephone. He was a great encourager, a great encourager uh, during that season and that time, and uh, just really was able to speak a lot of wisdom even into my life, Pastor Stacy. And uh, we are so thankful for him and his lovely wife Joyce. They have been in ministry for a long time, longer than we have. It was 45, 50 years, something like that now. And, uh, 78. No. Since, since, 19, <laughs> since 1978, so it's almost 50 years. Oh. Well, 78 years, okay. I'll just let him explain that. I don't even know what he means by that. Uh, I'm going to need a... I would say a revelation, but I can't say that. Word. <laughs> a revelation is what I need, but praise the Lord. Uh, but, uh, Apostle, uh, man of God, uh, uh, Bishop Joseph Matero is with us. And on all, also, all the CCC Network, uh, uh, men and women, would you just please stand? Can we give them just a quick praise God for all of them? For you to us and my praise. Uh, so what I would like for us to do is just welcome this great man of God that we love so dearly. He speaks all over the world, he ministers to so many people, has spoken wisdom, life, understanding, illumination, <laughs> so many people's lives. And so can we just give a big praise to God for Bishop Joseph Patera and Andrew Wise Jones. Amen. 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 And so good to be with everyone and just 
really blessed down here. Uh, we've been in the industry 44 years, so yeah. um, I don't know, between my husband and my son, they keep trying to make this me older. My son got up in church, I had to share, and he got up first and he said, he had a hoarse voice because he strains his vocal cord when he coughed or something. So he said, I was just showing, you know, that I'm getting old. If you're, if you're old, what does that mean? <laughs> 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 uh, but praise here. God, it's been wonderful to be serving the Lord that long. Um, we were giving our lives to the Lord at a young age and went pretty much right into ministry. Um, it's been an amazing journey, and, and serving God is an amazing journey. So as we're going through Psalm 23, it's just a wonderful psalm. And um, those of us that have been here in the retreat have been able to hear all the all, all, all the different points brought through verse by verse. So we're just kind of tying it up, but uh, many of you missed all the prior, and maybe you'll be able to get it, it would be wonderful. So surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And um, as I was meditating on this scripture, when we say, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, especially goodness, it's also uh, stated loving kindness. But when we think about goodness, I think about what is our definition of goodness. So this isn't a statement indicating no hardships or troubles, uh, but that even in the troubles, I can say all is good because I know the Lord is my shepherd. And I've learned through life that in the struggles and in the troubles and no matter what's happening, I can say all is good. Not because all looks good, but all is good with my soul. And so Proverbs 27, 13, David, um, uh, is of the Lord in the land of the living. So this shows that there's a time of trying and a time of testing and a time of weariness. But it's the goodness of God that upholds us. And the speaker is confident that they'll see the mercy and grace of God in this life. And that they will outlive their troubles and see deliverance from them. So the phrase is a message of hope and encouragement. To not despair, but to continue to believe in God's goodness. And I've seen so many Amen. people's faith shipwrecked when they failed to understand this. And thought that serving God and meant that everything was just going to work out for you. That everything's just going to fall into place. That everything you pray for is just going to happen. That God is going to give you all of your dreams and give you everything you wanted. Sometimes we associate this in other scriptures to think that God's goodness means everything will go well for us. We won't experience trouble, sorrow, pain, or grief. But it does not mean that. In this life, we will have trouble, sorrow, pain, and grief. Jesus even said the sun will shine on the evil and the good, and the rain falls on the righteous and the unrighteous. We have pain, we have troubles, and honestly, those of us that serve God and serve the purpose of God have more than our fair share. See, because besides our fair share of the usual challenges of life, we have the devil who hates us. And does everything he can to add to that. And I've learned that, you know what, the devil is merciless. God is merciful. Amen. And so what I've, I've shared with many young people in their journey is never give in. Never give in to the littlest sin. Never give in to the littlest temptation. Because once the devil has got you and gets you down, because of your disobedience, he's merciless. He's merciless. And even when you're trying to get up, he's still trying to beat you down. So don't ever give him that chance because I've gone down that road and it is not nice. That's good. So the difference is that in that sorrow, in that pain, in that struggle and challenge and grief, we have God as our refuge. God is our safe place. Yes. God is our strong tower, our comforter, our everlasting guide. And even when we mess up, God is our forgiver. Yes. yes. When I examine the life of David who wrote the psalm, I see that it was a life that was not absent from heartaches, disappointments, even places of confusion and bewilderment. Um, but it was, and this is the key, it was David's intimacy with God that preserved him in the midst of everything. Yeah. 
Yes. It was David's intimacy with God that preserved him. Yes. When, when nothing made sense, when in the most horrendous pain and grief and sorrow, when you read the stories, you can see it. But it was his intimacy with God, and the same with us. It will be our intimacy with God, our closeness with God. Yes. Our coming in, it says that the Lord is a, is a high tower, a strong tower with the righteous run in and are saved. We have to run into that tower. Yes. We have to run in from the storm into that tower. We have to make him our tower. We have to make him our refuge. We have to make him our place of comfort. We have to have that intimacy with him. The other day, this has been a really challenging season of my life really challenging season in my life. And so every day, it's just, it's wearisome. It wears on me. And I really want this season to end soon. And, um, but it seems to be still dragging on a little, little longer than I thought. And, and, and I want the season to end because I feel like that's when my rest will be. I want the season to end because then I can breathe. I want the season to end because, you know, then I'll just be able to, to, you know, just kind of kick back a little or just, or feel strange or feel okay. And when I was driving, I remember, I'm in the midst of it, and instead of just wanting it to end, because I think, I think that the answer is in the end. I think that the answer is in it just stopping. And, and I've been through this many times in my life. Just think that if this all stops now, I'll be okay. Right. And so I just began to worship God. I just turn on my, my music. I turn on my um, playlist and, and just start worshiping and just that presence of God that fills and, 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 and lifts and encourages and refreshes and washes off everything. And I realize this is it. It's not the end of the situation. Yes. That's that it. is my so answer. Good. It's being in Christ. Yes. In yes. Presence, yes. In the situation. Right. Amen. Amen. And we have to learn how to walk that way. And believe me, I've been one of those stubborn people like, God, you have to do it now. <laughs> and then I fasted and prayed and said, you know, that's going to make God's hand. I've, I've had situations I've wanted God to change. That I have fasted more than anyone I know all together has fasted. <laughs> and then I see the answers to their prayers. I'm like, God. And like I went through a season where I was, I, I was passive aggressively angry. <laughs> I would never dare say anything like, you know, like that I'm angry at God. I think lightning would strike me. Well, like, you know, I just thought really passive aggressive with him. I'm just not reading my Bible. I'm just pointing some of the brand new. Not just by the glory stories, but we're encouraged by the stories of hardship. Mm -hmm. And I share this because I was ministering in Uganda years ago, and and you know I'm, I just go with my husband, and all of a sudden he has all these things set up for me, and I'm like, this is not why I came. <laughs> <laughs> I'm you, and then we'll go on a safari. <laughs>
You know, I'm there walking on the water and the boat got farther and farther away and I never stopped walking on the water. And so, you know, but it was just, God, all the things he did, all the, the, the doors he opened. Like, there's just so much we have seen, so much I've seen in my life. And, you know, I thought I'd encourage them to share so that they could know, you know, you can do anything. Because I felt like I was just, who am I? I was nobody. The things I took upon myself were things I was not uh, prepared for, I was not educated for, the things that were in my heart I wanted to do, God just made a way for me to do them. And so I wanted to share with them, you know, you can do anything, you know, you could break any barrier, look what I did. But God stopped me and he said, I don't want you to share any of that. I want you to share from your weakness. <laughs> and so I got up there and, you know, I had been in a tremendous battle. And I just began to share with them from my struggle, from my weakness, how I had been in this place where I felt like, like the devil had found my Achilles heel. That wasn't fun. Because when he finds that Achilles heel, you better, you better learn how to come to another place of healing. And, and as I was just sharing from this weakness and ended it, I had all these women come up to me and just thank me because this is what they said and it really blew my mind. They said, you know, we think that all of you from the West, yeah. that you just have everything you need so you don't have hardship. Yeah. So you don't have the same struggles we have. So you don't suffer like we do. But we found out today that you're just like us mm -hmm. and that you have the same struggles and the same hardships. Mm -hmm the same pain, and that has given us hope. Yeah. So, you know, sometimes we need to share from our struggles, because even as ministers, you know, we feel like we have to put on this air of, you know, we are just always victorious. <laughs> <laughs> and so then everyone else that's fallen apart thinks that they're somehow failing God. And sometimes we as leaders think we can't share from a place of weakness, not acknowledge deep sorrow or pain. That is a sign of defeat or a sign of weakness or a lack of faith. Where did we go wrong? Where did we miss it? Um, that, that we can only have a good testimony and we can always say, so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in a battle. Many, I, I win some battles like really quickly. I'm one of those devil stompers. You don't know me. Like, and that's why I think he hates me even more. <laughs> but there's one battle that has been prolonged. And I cannot declare the victory in reality yet. I can only know that the victory is there. Right. And it's coming. Right. Right. And so I have to keep walking. And sometimes when you don't have, and I told you, I'm one of those people, like, I want it now, God, now. Yes. Like, you know, all right, I'll give you a few months, and I'll even give you a couple of years. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, <laughs> but you know what? When I think about goodness and mercy following me, what is goodness? Is it having a good life? What is a good life? Is it riches? Is it pain like the world thinks? Surrounded by loving family. Let me tell you something. Um, surrounded by loving family. If you if you see Facebook, everybody's family is perfect, right? Of course it is. One little family. I remember reading a post. I hope your your life is as good as it looks on Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's so cool. And then I see people like say this statement all the time. I just see people say, My life is full. You know, like yeah. I'm surrounded by the kids. Full of what? My life is full. And I'm like, Yes, it is. My life is full of challenges. Yes. <laughs> but that's not what you see. And you know, it's like, is, is, is our life just full when everything looks really well? Because it's not always going to be really well. And it's not going to always be really easy and it's not going to be without pain and without struggle. And, and so we need to understand that's not goodness. A good life is not acquiring riches and pain and success. And if you have all different definitions of success, my definition 
of success is just accomplishing what God has put in my hand to accomplish. There's a difference between wanting fame and wanting a platform. A platform is influence, fame is ego. My true place of accolades and my true noted accomplishment is going to be before the throne of God. And it may not, it's, it's going to look different than it looks here. And so, I have a, a few more minutes. I just want to share briefly, you know, one of my struggles that has been ongoing that I've had to pray through and pray through has been with one of my children. And, and you know, I have five beautiful children, four of them all serving God in amazing ways, pastoring. And um, I have one child that has struggled, has given in over and over again to bad choices. And so... We're always called to kind of pull her back out, and then she somehow goes back in and pull her back out. And so this has been um, something we've had that has kept us on our knees. And so in that crisis, and in the constant crises of um, my child, I've seen her entrapped by this, by the enemy. There's nothing worse for a parent than to see their child in a place of entrapment by the by the enemy and not to even realize it. Mm -hmm. And so that would cause me pain and, and suffering. And, and it was just things that didn't happen that were supposed to happen, benchmarks that I anticipated to happen that didn't happen. And so I had to just let go of everything I wanted. I had to let go of everything I anticipated as being the way to go and leave it in God's hands. And in my deepest pain, I began to relate to the great patriarchs of God in a new way. And this was so eye-opening to me. Because I saw David, and I saw uh, Joseph and Jacob, and I saw Moses. I saw, uh, and even in pastoring a church, I saw Moses' grief of, in trying to lead and pastor some really difficult people. But I saw David with his cry of lament over Absalom to the point that everybody was like, enough already about Absalom. We're all here, hello? And so he had to let go of that grief and move on and keep on going. And that's, that was hard for him. But the greatest, the greatest story, and I want to share this, that God really spoke to me in the midst of everything, because I had to let go of what should have, would have, could have been. And I just found myself always grieving over what should have, could have, would have. You know? And I know as I pray that like God has been doing the work and is going to use all this and turn it around and in your face, devil, and that's it. I know that. And I always tell him it's going to just blow up in your face, Satan. It's going to blow up in your face. So just wait for it. She's <laughs> <laughs> a tough cookie. But the story of Jacob, the story of Joseph hit me in a whole new way. Because we always think about Joseph. We always see, you know, his journey of how he was you know, sold as a slave by his brothers, of how he was falsely imprisoned when he was doing right, um, when he was being right, how over and over again, um, things just kept going wrong, but he kept on believing God and kept on trusting God. And so we learn and we get encouraged in our faith through his story. But all of a sudden I saw Jacob. And I thought, Jacob, for his entire life, thought that his son had been murdered. This son that was his favorite. Right. This son that he loved. This son that he had all these aspirations for. And in his mind, he was dead and gone. And God did not allow Jacob to see the amazing work that had been done until right before his dying breath. Right before he was, then at the end of his life, he got to see what God had done in Joseph's life. And, and we don't ever think about Jacob's story. Mm. We don't ever think about that. And how many of you here are parents? Yeah. You understand that. Mm -hmm. You understand the heart of a parent. We don't ever think about Jacob's story. God made me see that. It's a choice. You know, I have my own plan. Mm. And it's not just about what you wanted. And it's not just about how you wanted it. And so the important thing is that we know that God's goodness is with us. God's mercy is with us. I thought that God was not a loving God anymore when he did not answer me 
as soon as I needed it. I thought he was not a kind God. I even questioned whether God existed. I said, maybe when I worship and I feel all this, it's just some, you know, neural wave going on and, you know, it's just some physiological, psychological thing. I got that far away in my past progressive walk with God. But I found that place of goodness of God in the midst of the trial, in the midst of the struggle, in the midst of the pain, in the midst of the sorrow. That is you, your intimacy with God is what holds you and carries you. And surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. God is a good God. Amen. God is a good God. God is a good God. Yes, he God is. is a good God. And yes. I tell myself every day, God is a good God. God is goodness. And so his goodness is there. May I never question it. Because I don't get what I want when I want it. And maybe walk with God in a faithful way. Trusting in him. Allowing him to work his plan and do his good thing on the earth through us. Thank you. so many so-called men and women of God brag about only things that make them look good. Mm. And so I appreciate that honesty. Mm. Praise God. Do me a favor. Can you put the clock at 20 minutes? Mm -hmm. I don't want to go longer than my wife. And it's, I could have listened to you all night. I love that. Um, so, <laughs> I'm going to come at it from a different angle, uh, just a little bit overview of scripture. Um, so the text is, goodness and mercy will follow me over the days of my life, and I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. God, give us your wisdom and help us understand this yes. from another perspective yes, that is relevant to us right now yes, in this church. Amen. Amen. So when we look at David's yearning, David constantly said things like in Psalm 27 that he longs to dwell in the house of the Lord, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord, to seek him in his temple. So David didn't separate the house of the Lord from the Lord himself. Uh, we also see other passages where he talks about how he yearns for God, even as a deer pants for streams of water. Um, how he said, whom have I in heaven but you? Psalm 73. But apart from you, I desire nothing on earth. And so David's longing was for God. And we see as we look at the Hebrew scriptures that there was a contrast between death and life constantly through the scriptures. And life was not, as my wife was saying, just having a good life. They never separated a good life from Yahweh. 
Yahweh was, it says in uh, Psalm uh, 36, that in him are the rivers or springs of life. He is the river of life, and in his light we see light. And so from the Hebrew perspective, the closer you are to Yahweh, the more life you have. The further away you were from Yahweh, like if you were in the wilderness or the abyss, you were closer to death. And so the Hebrew perspective or the biblical perspective of death and life is so different from us in this materialistic, consumeristic culture where life is all about having everything you need and being satisfied and being able to get entertained anytime you want. Uh, being able to go to any city, buy any house, drive luxury cars. That's foreign to the worldview of scripture. No. David was rich, he was king, but yet he longed to be with God because he realized that that was in him his life. He realized that in him are the springs of life. And so as I back up to the text my wife had, goodness and mercy will follow me, what was he really talking about? My wife alluded to it. As we go to Exodus 34, you remember in Exodus 33, Moses asked God to reveal his glory. Moses had been with God for 40 days and 40 nights. And you would think he would be bored. The poor guy didn't have a cell phone. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't have a fellowship with anybody else. For crying out loud, he didn't even have food or water. Yet, after being 40 days and 40 nights, with Yahweh, God essentially said to him, ask me anything you want. And he had no other cry, but show me your ways. Yeah. The more you're with God, the more you're addicted to him. Yes. The more you can never be satisfied. As a matter of fact, once you've met Jesus, everything else is boring. Yes. Truly met him. He said, show me your ways that I may know you. Yes. And then when he felt like he had another in, he took another shot and he said, show me your glory. And what is glory? Well, the Hebrew word has to do with weight, but meaning the glory of God is the consummation or summation of all that God is. And it's weighty. You yeah. can't comprehend it. You can't describe it. You can't even go near it. You cannot experience it without being totally changed. It's waiting. And so God had to say to him, you cannot see my face and live. But I'll put you in the cleft of a rock and you'll see my hind parts. And so in Exodus 34, verse 6, God begins to preach to Moses. He didn't preach seven steps to happiness. <laughs> the highest sermon that could ever be preached is to proclaim who Yahweh is. Yes. Yeah. And Yahweh said, the Lord, the Lord, he was basically giving different aspects of the triune communion, the Godhead. He described himself as full of mercy and kindness and goodness. Those three attributes is what he described as he passed by Moses. Imagine God telling us about himself. Imagine God preaching a sermon just to you. Moses was that important because all he wanted was to know God. All he wanted was to be in God's presence. And after 40 days and 40 nights, he still couldn't get enough. As a matter of fact, if Moses were to have his way, he would have wound up like Enoch, who walked with God and was not, because he had this testimony that he pleased God. And uh, so Moses 
had that experience, he's out proclaiming who he was. So when David says, goodness and mercy will follow me, he's basically saying Yahweh is going to be with him. And that's why he would experience goodness. There's no goodness outside of Yahweh. There's no life outside of Yahweh. That's why Joshua said in Joshua chapter 24, choose you this day whom you will serve. That's why he said, choose life or choose death. There is no in-between. Doesn't matter how healthy you are, doesn't matter how much money you are, doesn't matter how much social media influence you have. Yeah. If you aren't close to Yahweh, if you're not born again, if you're not saved, you're dead. Right. You are in exile. You're in the wilderness, so to speak. You're away from him. And so David describes goodness and mercy as basically Yahweh is going to be with him. And then he said, I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now, in order to understand what he means, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever, we have to understand that the original earth that God created was meant to be a microcosm of the universal temple that God made. Right. Says so Psalm 78, that he stretched forth the universe as a tent yes. to dwell in. So initially, the universe had no separation between heaven and earth, between the physical and the spiritual. And then he made the earth as a microcosm of that temple. Right. And you could see through the six days of creation how the earth was literally constructed as the house of the Lord. Right. There was no bifurcation between heaven and earth. As we look at uh, Genesis 1 6, it says he separated the waters from the waters and put a canopy over where the spirit was. And the word uh, canopy has to do with a dome. They actually thought there was a solid dome over, that the clouds were a solid dome. And so you have the spirit of God, Genesis 1 2, hovering over the face of the deep under a solid dome. And then you see. How he said, uh, I'm going to set lights, Genesis uh, 1.8, I'm going to put lights, luminaries to govern the sky, or to, I'm sorry, to govern the seasons, the times and the seasons. And when he said uh, that he was putting lights, meaning the sun and the moon and the stars, to govern the times and the seasons, that word light was the same exact Hebrew word for when he constructed the tabernacle in Exodus 25 and made the menorah lamp. Wow. And so basically the lights served as God's menorah lamp under the dome wow. of the temple. And it was there to give time and season, meaning that the whole universe was originally created and the sun, moon, and stars as the menorah lamp were originally created so that we would honor the religious festivals of Yahweh so that all of the universe would in unison worship God because the culmination of the six days of creation was not the creation of mankind, but it was the seventh day when God enters his rest. And so the whole of creation was made for the Sabbath, which was a day of worship in the Hebrew understanding. As a matter of fact, it tells us that, uh, you know, we know from the Old Testament, from the days, around those days, that when they made a temple to a god, they would put an idol in the midst of that temple that would represent the deity or the god, and the concentration of the power of that god was in that idol. Well, God did the same thing. He made man in his own image. We became the image, the icon of Yahweh for his cosmic temple so that we can represent him. And that's why God made Adam out of the dust of the earth, which gave him authority in the earth realm. But he also breathed into him the breath of life, which gave him authority in heaven, because he was called as the idol, or the image, I should say, the icon, the image of God, to unite heaven and earth, so that the whole of creation would culminate in the worship of God, heading towards the Sabbath rest that only Yahweh can have. We also know that when they made temples in those days, when the temple was finished, the God would sit on the throne and rest. 
God sat on his throne and rested. There's a lot of things I can share with you showing how the original creation was meant to be God's temple. So when David says, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever, he was referring to the day when all the sin would be removed, when that thing which separated God from men, when the day, day would come when heaven and earth would be reunited. And we know that that took place when Christ our Lord came. Yes. How many understand that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so we see that after the fall, there were many attempts at reuniting heaven and earth, of creating a portal, of bringing heaven and earth together. We had altars that were erected. Abraham made an altar. Isaac made an altar. Uh, Jacob rested on a rock and saw a portal between heaven and earth, a ladder going up. Uh, from heaven to earth, and we know that that was a prophecy of the coming of Christ who told Nathaniel, connecting himself to that ladder as the real ladder, he said, you are someone who has no guile. Basically, he was connecting himself to the story of Jacob, who was called a deceiver, and he was saying to Nathaniel, you don't have guile, and then he said, you're shocked that I can tell you you were under a fig tree? I'm telling you right now, hereafter you're going to see the heavens open and angels ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Thus, he was the portal that Jacob rested his head on. The rock was Jesus, and that was showing that Jesus as the rock was the portal that Jacob was waiting for. Uh, so we see Moses erecting a tabernacle, but even after he finished the tabernacle in Exodus 40, and the glory came down, even though he was able to be with God's glory in the temp, uh, top of Mount Sinai, this is interesting. The glory fell, but he was not able to enter the tabernacle. It showed that before Christ, there was limitations. There was protocols. There was regulations. It was not easy to come into Yahweh's presence. Right. And from uh, Exodus 40 all the way to Leviticus chapter 9 with five different sacrifices, different protocols, showing the difference between unclean and clean. And finally, at the end of chapter 9, after Aaron made a sacrifice with the birth offering, Yahweh showed up and brought fire. And everybody was able to experience God as a congregation for the first time. Even though Moses couldn't enter, now everyone experienced it after the uh, tedious processes that God laid out in Leviticus chapter 1 to 9. But unfortunately, right away, after God showed up, Exodus 40, but Moses couldn't enter in. But then God showed up, everyone could enter in. But then, Nathan happened to buy you. Oh, wow, God's accessible. Hallelujah. <laughs> they got a sensor filled with fire, and they ran into the most holy place and got struck them down dead. Called it strange fire. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of strange fire today. Yeah. 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 A lot of unauthorized use of Yahweh. Yes. It's a whole God. other message that we can preach. That's right. God's remedy for that, by the way, is probably because they were drunk and entered in because the beginning of chapter 10 of Leviticus, God instructs Aaron and says, do not get drunk and try to come into my presence. And I'm summarizing it. God began to teach them from chapter 11 on the difference between the holy and the profane. First, there was the difference between unclean and clean. Holy and profane, and his remedy so that people won't get struck down and dead again was the Day of Atonement. Yep. Yom Kippur, Leviticus 16. When it was a goat sacrificed and given up to Yahweh, only the high priest was able to enter into the most holy place only one time a year and not without blood. And another goat was sent into the wilderness. Interesting. It was symbolizing it was symbolizing death and resurrection. The goat that was sent into the wilderness was sent to a demon called Azazel. The wilderness represented hell, exclusion from God, exile. The goat that was burned, he said, I'd rather be the goat that went into exile. No, you wouldn't. The goat that was burned, the aroma of that fire of the goat ascended to heaven. That goat represented resurrection. Mm. The other goat represented death, pointing to Christ, who 
who bore our sins, but also took our place as our own sacrifice. Amen. Jesus came, and I'll try to wrap this up in five minutes. I'm giving you a three-day seminar. <laughs> Probably 25 minutes. I'm just trying to flow in the spirit yeah, 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 yeah. Jesus came. And the interesting thing about Jesus is he didn't just come to die on the cross individually to say how sin so we could just go to heaven. There was so much more to this. It says that when he died, you read this in Mark 15, that the curtain that separated the holy place from the most holy place was ripped asunder. What in the world was that? When I first read that as a new Christian, okay, I don't know why this is in the Bible, but that's interesting. It's like the earthquake. Maybe God was just trying to give a sign to somebody. But the curtain is what separated God's presence from the rest of the world. Only the high priest could enter that, through that curtain on Yom Kippur with the blood of an animal. When Jesus died and said it was finished, not an accident, the curtain ripped, as God was showing that now the way to the most holy place is open to everybody. The same way he was open to everyone in Leviticus 19, now he was now open without all those five sacrifices, rituals, clean and unclean. He became the sacrifice once and for all. He made us complete. And he tells us in Hebrews 10, verse 19, that we can come through the most holy place, through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. And we can come by faith into a place where our hearts are sprinkled clean yes. by pure water and that our bodies can be washed all through the blood, all through the body and the sacrifice of Christ. He did everything for us. He did it all. How many understand that? So you don't have to go through these animal sacrifices. You don't have to worry about clean and unclean. You don't have to worry about whether God's going to strike you dead. As a matter of fact, we've all experienced the most holy place here today. Didn't you feel the power? Didn't you feel the presence? How many felt the power and presence of God? Well, if this was 2,200 You would have had to be a son of Aaron. You would have had to be consecrated. You would have had to go through protocols. You would have had to know the difference between clean and unclean. You would have had to make sure that you bathed, that you didn't touch a dead body, that you didn't touch a woman who had a menstrual period. Yeah. You would have had to make sure that you were in a place where you were totally pure. And if you were... Yeah. Then you had a chance to live when you right. came right. and met a holy God. Right. And they still weren't sure after going through all those protocols, right. which is why they put a rope around their waist to put a bell. Because if they were struck down dead, no one dared go in and get them. Yeah. Right. They would have had to pull them out. Right. <laughs> Jesus came, not just to die on the cross. Right, right. He said the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Mm. The Greek word for uh, dwelt is the word tabernacle. Yeah. Same concept as the tabernacle of Moses. Every attempt in the Old Testament, whether it's Jacob's ladder, Moses' tabernacle, Solomon's temple, the Ezekiel's temple, every attempt was just a type, a shadow that pointed to Jesus' body. Yes, yes. When he came, yes. he tabernacled among us. Right. Just like when the tabernacle was finished, the glory of God filled the temple. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whether it was Solomon dedicating the temple in yeah. 2 Kings chapter 5, where the priest couldn't even stand to minister, or the glory of God fell where Moses wouldn't even dare enter. Yeah. After the tabernacle was dedicated and finished, when Jesus came, it says, and the word became flesh and tabernacled among us, and no coincidence, and we beheld his glory. 
The glory as of the only begotten Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth comes by the Father. No one has seen God at any time, but the only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father. He has what? Made him known. If you see Jesus, you've seen the Father. That's why we're not struck down dead anymore. We yeah. see Jesus. And so, the key to manifesting the glory of God is in Christ. And here's the good thing about it. When Christ came as that tabernacle, now this might blow your mind, I probably shouldn't even bring it up. Not much time. He had not just a tabernacle that released glory out of himself, but in Christ was dwelling the new heaven and new earth. He was bringing a new tabernacle that had to be renewed because the whole universe fell with the sin of Adam, was disconnected, heaven and earth was disconnected. When Jesus came, he brought the beginnings, the inauguration. That's why he preached the kingdom of God is here. He was saying, I am now uniting heaven and earth. That's why he told us to pray that his kingdom will come, his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It was a universe, a new heaven and new earth in him. And he brought it forth. And that's why he said, when you're born again, you will see the kingdom. You become part of that. Yeah. The great thing is this. Jesus carries the house of God, but he adopted us into his family. We are now his temple. We are part of his house. And the more we as a church are connected to him, the more we're releasing the glory of God. That's why he says, when the sons of God are manifest on the earth, all creation will be liberated. Because the key is that the church in Christ releases his presence on the earth. And we're adopted in his house, his family, which is why this is what I'll end with. The culmination of human history is, he's, John said, I serve a new heaven and a new earth. In the past, the focus was on the land. But now it's a city, earth. Bride. This new Jerusalem was coming out as a bride adorned for a husband. Who's that? It's the church. Yeah. The church and the dwelling of God be, reconstitutes the new universe, the new house of God. It's shaped just like a cube. It's shaped just like a dome. It's replacing the old heaven, the old earth. And we, in the house of God, are now adopted in so that as he becomes everything that mankind has been looking for, we are also sharing in that as his bride. We are also his temple and his house. Amen. Can you imagine Amen. that he doesn't even separate his house, his temple from the church because we are the temple of the Holy Ghost. So as the church continues to grow, as the church continues to make disciples, as the church continues to do what it's called to do, we are releasing the glory of God as the temple of Christ is releasing the glory of God. And we are indistinguishable from Christ because we're in Christ. Oh, my God. There will be a fullness of the kingdom manifest when Jesus comes back. Amen. Second bodily return. Amen. And until then, we are continued, called to continue to occupy until he comes. Amen. We're called to continue to mature as sons. Yes. Manifest his glory so that all creation can feel that release. Amen. The glorious living of the sons of God. Amen. Amen. How many understand what I'm saying? Amen. Praise God. That's all. Stand up. In conclusion, when David says, Goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. He said the word forever because he wasn't looking for an earthly physical temple. He was looking for that day when there'd be ultimate reconciliation. And here's the good news. All of you are part of it.
how many of you want to participate with Jesus in the renewal of all things? How many want to participate with Jesus in releasing the glory of God on the earth? Let me see your hands. If that's you, I want you to come up so we can pray. God has called you. You are a carrier of God's spirit. It's not just about going to heaven. The fact that the temple of God is in you, and you are the temple of God, rather, says the fact that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. That means when Jesus came in you, it was so you would see the kingdom. It was so that you would begin the process of bringing a new heaven and new earth. We're not going to do it before he comes back bodily. But well, we're beginning the process. 